Welcome to the Immigrant Finance Podcast, a show dedicated to everything money, online business, and immigration, because immigrant families deserve to build generational wealth too. I'm your host, Adina, social entrepreneur, immigration attorney, and financial educator and coach for immigrant families. I created the Immigrant Finance Platform with my husband, Mauricio, who immigrated to the U.S. eight years ago after we struggled through the whole process of trying to figure out finances as an immigrant family alone. We wanted to share what we learned about building wealth with others along the way and created the Immigrant Finance School Group Coaching Program where we teach immigrants and their families like you how to manage their money, get started investing, and build online businesses in just weeks, all with group accountability and support. Our clients have been able to get started investing and develop lifelong plans to build generational wealth regardless of their immigration status actually launched an online business they've been dreaming of starting for years, bring in enough income to leave a job with a shitty boss, and book up their calendar for the rest of the month just after announcing their new coaching business. I'm coming to you with a new show several times a week with stories about online business lessons, money and mindset insights, and guest interviews to help you become financially empowered. Each episode will switch between personal finance and online business topics. Now let's get to this week's episode. Hello, everyone. This is Adina from Immigrant Finance Today, and I'm here with a very special guest with um, who's here to join us, Flavia from Latina Traveler. So welcome, Flavia. Thank you for being here. Hi, Adina. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really glad to be here to talk with you about this today. I think it's a really important topic. Me too. I can't wait to learn from you and for our audience to learn from you. Um, I love traveling so much and um, that's you know how I met my husband and we both have traveled, lived abroad a lot. So I am excited to talk more about travel and its connection to finances since I know um, you cover that and mental health as well. So thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, and do you want to give like a quick kind of background on yourself and then we can jump into the show? Yes. So I am a Peruvian American. Both of my parents immigrated from Peru to the U.S. in about the mid to late 80s and have been living there pretty much since then. I So I was born in the U.S. in New Jersey. And although I lived the majority of my life there, I also spent a lot of time in Peru. I myself have decided to immigrate to Spain where I currently am. I'm in Barcelona. So my immigrant story kind of comes already for two generations. So my parents' generation mm-hmm. and now my own. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. How did you decide to move to Barcelona? Um, I personally never felt like the U.S. was for me, although, yeah. like I said, I spent so much time there and everything. Um I was always trying to find my place in the world. I spent a lot of time in Peru, like I said. And although I do love it, I'm not completely discarding not living there. I didn't feel like it was the right time for me now. And Mm -hmm. I... I've loved Europe. I've come a few times. And originally, I even considered doing my whole undergrad in Barcelona before even coming to visit it, actually. And uh, I didn't. I didn't end up doing that. I did my undergrad in New York. But I did finally come visit it after when I was in college um, and then a few times in the following years. And then in 2019, uh, when I came to visit, I have a cousin that lives here. We were walking around the city and we passed by a university and I told her that I'm going to go to this university. I (laughs) had about two months left to apply. (laughs) I did it. I got accepted and I moved here. Yeah, (laughs) it was very, very quick. (laughs) Um, And I originally only wanted to just do the program, so my master's program, and then I thought I'd probably just go back to the U.S. or Peru or somewhere else. Um, But I ended up falling in love with the city and really liking the proximity to the rest of Europe and parts of Africa. So I wanted to stay. So I'm currently doing my second master's here in Barcelona. Oh, that is so amazing and such a wonderful example of just like having vision and making something happen. You just saw this university and you're like, I'm going there. It's happening. And it worked out. Yeah, somehow it worked out. Very close on deadlines, though, but it worked out. It's uh, it reminds me of my one of my favorite quotes from Have you read The Alchemist by any chance? I started to and I did not finish it, but I did. Okay, I did read 
It's it's one of those books that actually brings me to traveling because um, I lived in Egypt for a year after college, and someone told me to read this book, and it was very formative for me early in my twenties and, and with traveling. But there's this quote that's something like, uh, basically when you really want something, the universe conspires to make it happen. Mm-hmm. Yes, <laughs> so that I just totally reminds me that. of that. <laughs> Completely yeah. Agree. Yes. And uh, that's something traveling has really shown me. Um, yeah, that's so cool. Okay. So your family had immigrated to the U S you've, you've immigrated to Peru and out to Spain. Um, just curious in terms of like, terms how do you kind of think of yourself with all these different labels out there because I know something I noticed when I lived abroad is like Americans who immigrate to countries are called expats but other people are called immigrants do you know what I mean yes Uh, that's very (laughs) interesting that you actually said that because on my uh, podcast Instagram page I actually literally just um, did like a whole post about that immigrant versus Uh... expat so it's so funny that you just mentioned that Um, but really I guess by definition, depending on who you'd be talking to, I would be considered an expat. But mm-hmm. I think depending on some people, I could also be considered an immigrant because I'm not, expats are known to be mainly white and educated and just come from privileged families. Although I do feel like I am educated and in a way do come from a slightly privileged family I'm not white so I mm-hmm. don't know exactly which one I fall under but I like to call myself an immigrant instead because I would like to change that narrative of like immigrants are considered as something that people that are moving to other countries because they aren't educated or because they aren't this mm-hmm. and I want to change that narrative because all na- my parents although they were immigrants they are they were educated my dad is a doctor in Peru and in the U.S. he was never mm-hmm. seen as that just because of language barrier or because he just didn't get to be a doctor in the US um, because of a few other reasons. So I definitely want to change that narrative on like seeing immigrants as seeing them as like not productive or not um, as welcomed into society. I really appreciate you saying that. And that's something I thought a lot about too. And um, you're the first person I've had a chance to talk to on the podcast about this topic. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, like I've lived both my husband Mao and I have lived in different countries. Um, and you know, I, I lived in Egypt for a while. I lived in Ecuador. He, he actually did his master's in Spain. So he's had some of that experience too, but, um, those labels are really interesting how people talk about those experiences and, and how you're referred to, you know, based on your privilege. So I think a lot of it does have to do with privilege and race. Um, so I appreciate you pushing back on, on those labels and, um, I've kind of wondered too, like, can I say I've immigrated before because I have lived abroad for not just for travel. So I, I, I'm always curious about that topic. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. for the most part, like immigrant is considered somebody who's still like moving abroad, but then looking to permanently live there while an expat right. is kind of going for a certain amount of time, whether for work, for school, or maybe just going there for a short amount of time and then going somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's helpful. Cool. Um, so what led you to have this focus on traveling and eventually lead to your page? So I've been traveling pretty much my whole life. Um, the first time I was ever on a plane, I was about a month old, going from New Jersey down to Lima, Peru, to have my par- grandparents, I guess, meet me for the first time. Um mm. And since then, I would go there every year uh, with my sister. We would go there every summer, mainly for about the whole summer. And as we grew a little older, we did start going to other places. We went to Argentina. We went to Europe. uh, We went to China. So instead of doing like a quinceanera, we did a trip to Europe. Instead of doing a Sweet 16, we did the trip to China. So it's been very present in my life, uh, whether it was internationally or domestically. We also did a lot of road trips when we were younger throughout the country to Florida, to Colorado. So it's definitely always been around for me. <laughs> I imagine that tone was set by your parents, it sounds like. Oh, yes, for sure. If it wasn't for them, I definitely would. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's really affirming because we always talk about, we have a um, a young baby daughter and we're like, we want her to travel a lot too. And so that's just affirming. It's like, all right, we got to make it happen then when she's young. 
Yes. So that she has that culture. Definitely. That's exactly what it is. If my parents didn't take me places and kind of meterme el bichito de la curiosidad, like I probably wouldn't have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's been a constant theme in your life, it sounds like. And was there a point when you kind of realized like, okay, this is going to be part of my life professionally or in terms of my identity or how I express myself? So yes, but I never felt like it could be. Like I knew that I wanted mm. to do something travel related work-wise or life-wise. I just wasn't sure exactly how to really introduce it into my life professionally. So I've done many other jobs that haven't been work-related with the goal to then travel. So mm -hmm. I, what I did do after I graduated college is I would work for six or seven months, like a lot, like two or three jobs, save up money, and then go somewhere for like a few months yeah. and then not work while I was there. So, but now I'm with my master's that I've actually done, the first one being in tourism and now this one being in travel journalism, I'm seeing that there are many ways that I can incorporate it into my professional life. So that way it's not just something I do on my free time or leisure time. Ooh, I love this. This is um, just making me think about too, like I, this idea of integrating your identities, mm -hmm. right? Um, yes. Because it sounds like, you know, you were, you were working to do what you love before mm -hmm. and now you're finding a way to merge them and just be you. Exactly. Yes, that is my goal. <laughs> yeah. And I, that's, I think what I've seen are some of the most exciting or successful um, online businesses or online presences out there where it's people who are like integrating their passion and, and what's true to who they are into what they're doing. So it's all just kind of seamless mm -hmm. right. and yes. they're just being themselves. So how has that kind of played out for you? Um, so I've done some jobs where I've actually led trips, uh, during the summer. So this was definitely pre COVID, um, and it actually took me to Hawaii for the first time. I ended up going Ooh, nice. twice in one summer and then uh, another time, another summer, um, which I had never gone to before because I always felt like it was so expensive and so far away. But now I've been there three times already and I didn't have to pay a single dime really <laughs> to go. Wow. Which was amazing. Okay. That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're you're, you're just making me think back to all my fun travel memories too. Both my husband and I were like, we would also try to find opportunities where it would be funded to travel. Right. <laughs> so he, yes. he did, um, he did like, he was like a lifeguard in New Jersey in the mm -hmm. summers. He would do the, the J one program okay. and, and like, you know, just come and, and just be basically work and get, get it all paid for so he could have fun with his friends and explore and like do those little trips around the U S. Right. Yeah. And I would always try to find some kind of scholarship or something to fund my travel. I did that for Egypt and Ecuador as well. Mm -hmm. So you know, let's talk about the finances of it. Cause I know, um, I see on your page, it says like cheap travel for Latinas and women. Mm -hmm. um, and that obviously traveling is something some people think you can only do if you're rich. So how have you been able to figure this out? And, and what do you teach people? Yes. So I, um, I normally, like I had said, I normally had always had this idea like that I would save up money. And then with that, be able to use it to fund my trips. Um, so mm -hmm. but with that, I would also I use credit cards that have like certain rewards um, and yes. ones that give me more rewards based on, you know, where I purchase, whether it's like at a restaurant or grocery, et cetera. Um, so I would try and use those as best as I could to then cover like thing, the most expensive things that I would have, like flights or possibly mm -hmm. stays or, or something like that. But up until now, I've mainly, when I travel places, I tend to stay in hostels or I tend to stay in just cheaper accommodation. Because for me, it's always mm -hmm. been more about the experiences that I could get at that location, like being able to do paragliding or um, hot air balloon rides or things like that. Like that was always more for me, the more important part. And I think it also does come yeah. back to my parents that they always instill that experiences is just more important than where you stay at. So I yeah. kind of kept that mindset. So for me, this day has never really been too important about where it's at. So I always try and save on that. Um, 
and I say cheap and I kind of have it in like those parentheses because as I am getting a little older, I do like comfortable things. So I feel Mm -hmm. like I will be kind of progressing into something that feels right for me, but still will be in a way that is cheap. Like I like to look for discounts and deals and any way that I could save some kind of percentage. Like I will always ask for a student discount because I'm still a student. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. any way that I could get any type of discount, I will be there getting my discount. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions um, for, or or what is your process for figuring out what hostel you're going to stay at kind of balancing those things of wanting to have low cost, but also comfort? Um, So really that transition has only really started for me maybe in the last year or so when I actually haven't been traveling as much due to COVID. Um, So now that I will be, traveling a little bit more, hopefully within these next couple of summer months, I'm going to actually be seeing how I'm going to be doing this transition myself because it it is going to be something that is fairly new for me. That'll be really interesting to, I think, for your audience to hear about that experience because it is something that definitely happens as you get older. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're not okay with like sleeping in super uncomfortable positions anymore. (laughs) Yeah, like I think back to some of the hostel situations I did. I'm like, I cannot believe I did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, what is standing out of this like shared hostel room in Amsterdam? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> All these rows of bunks. There's probably 20 people in this room, and like a lot of people were on drugs. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. really scary. <laughs> <laughs> right? I know. When you think yeah. about it, you're like, oh gosh. And then now you have a daughter, so it's like, oh gosh, what is she gonna get into? I know. <laughs> I know. And now I understand why my parents would worry when I was like, hey, I'm, I'm going to go um, live in Egypt for a year and I've never been and by myself. <laughs> it's like seeing a year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's funny because my dad actually came to visit and he had this whole thing like, you know, I'm going to see it for myself. And if I, if I don't feel like it's safe, I'm going to make her come home. Right. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> this is just a quick, funny story. He comes. He absolutely loved it. We had the best time. I took him you know, focusing on experiences. Like you said, you know, we went camping in the desert, all this stuff. He loved it. He left. And then like a month later, the Egyptian revolution happened. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I was living a block away from Tahrir Square. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was an interesting experience, but yeah, I had a great time. Um, so yeah, just going back to travel. Um, I, I love to hear a little bit more about how it's, changed you as a person and what you've learned through your experiences? So I feel it's definitely made me a lot more accepting in general of different cultures and of different, um, just different peoples in general. Because although the U.S. is very diverse, depending on where you live, it may not be as diverse. So Mm -hmm. I was born and lived around Newark, New Jersey, till I was about 10, which is very diverse. Mm But we moved then a little bit farther south in the same state and it was no longer diverse at all so I think traveling the more places I went to the more people I met it just kind of opened my world view that there's just so much more than just my hometown than just the U.S. than just the people that I grew up knowing there's just so much to see to meet people uh, places to explore definitely yeah. And um, I want to ask you next about mental health and that, how that's been a part of your experience and how you think about travel and what you share. So I get anxiety. I get anxiety probably daily for little things sometimes and for other times like a little bit bigger. Um, but I definitely felt that it may have started when I was younger, probably like in high school age, I would get like a lot of social anxiety at times. But for me, travel kind of helped me not just so much with the anxiety part, because although it it sometimes can cause me anxiety when I am going somewhere brand new, but it's kind of like that exciting type of roller coaster is about to dip down excitement Mm -hmm. in my stomach that it's just like a good kind of anxiety for me that it's a it kind of helps me channel certain things that I may have felt one way about, but now can change that same feeling into something that gets me excited about something else. 
Ooh, that's really cool how to think about how to channel it in a way that feels more true to you and can be mm-hmm. a positive experience. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And that's something I talk a lot about too with our audience is like the difference between um, having, you know, that pit in your stomach where you have a really bad feeling because mm-hmm. you're, so, you're, and you're scared and, and you just, you know, something's off versus like the type of fear where I call it scared sighted. Like you're, you're scared, but you're excited what you were just describing mm-hmm. when you travel. Um, and that kind is a fear is usually the one that's pushing you outside your comfort zone exactly. and helping you grow. Yeah. Is that how you think about it? Yes. Yes, definitely. Because I feel like if I were to just stay in one place, that would then cause me anxiety. Now going new places, it actually alleviates it because I have gone through that process so many times of like not knowing what's going to happen or what's going to come. But it's kind of changed the way my body and my mind kind of reacts to it in a positive way. Amazing. So you're, you've been reprogramming yourself essentially. Like. Yeah. <laughs> that is, that is really cool. Um, and so what is, what do you tell people about mental health and drawing from that experience? Like, how do you share that with people? Yeah. So I feel like within the Latino community in general, there's just been such a stigma around mental health where it's like, we don't yeah. talk about it or we just kind of keep it within the family or just to yourself. So that way, you know, the gente no piensa que estás loca. And Mm -hmm. mental health shouldn't be something that we're scared of. It's definitely something that a lot of us can pass through, whether it's, you know, something small and temporary or something long term and long lasting. But I feel like as a community and as individuals, we need to learn how to kind of confront that because whether or not we want to say it exists or not, it's still if it's still affecting whether our daily lives or just our lives in general, it's still going to keep us from possibly doing the things that make us happy or going Mm -hmm. places that we want to go to just because uh, we may be scared about what other people may think about Mm -hmm. it. So I just, I try and talk about it in a way to kind of break down the fact that it shouldn't be stigmatized because uh, it still happens whether or not we talk about it or not. And we might as well feel comfortable talking about it. And you're such a testament to how, you know, you, how you can share it openly and sort of start minimizing some of that stigma by normalizing it and, and sharing it and, and talking about how it can be a positive thing. It sounds like for your passion, even from what you were describing. Yes. Yeah. That's really, really important. Um, I'm curious on this topic, how have you seen other people think about the connection between travel and mental health now that you've been sharing more on this intersection? So I think when I mention, I guess kind of all three of them combined, a lot of people don't see the connection at first. So I do kind of have to talk a little bit about it for them to see it. But in a way, when I travel, even leaving the anxiety part aside, it genuinely just makes me happy. I see a change in my mood because I get really excited that I'm going somewhere new and just, it's like all of that. Um, oh, I forget that, uh, that happy hormone that you get <laughs> the name of it right now. Serotonin or dopamine? Yeah, dopamine. Yes. Dopamine. Um, I feel like I get a rush of dopamine when I know I'm going to be going to these places that I've read about or seen pictures and I'm going to be seeing it with my own eyes. So even though it has helped me with the anxiety, it also just creates like a blanket of like, not even a blanket, but it just kind of like integrates within me like this happiness because yeah. I am doing something that I really like that I want to do. And for me, it just, it just makes sense. It's just connected. Yep. Yep. That's so cool. Um, I, I love it. I want to talk a little bit about domestic travel in the U S because we have many listeners in our audience who don't have the privilege to travel abroad because of their immigration status or situation. Um, so, and I see you, you've, de- you've covered definitely travel in the U S. So do you have any mm-hmm. advice for people in that um, area, how they can still have travel be a part of their life while staying within borders? Yeah, honestly, I've been to a lot of different places and the U S for natural beauty. It's just, amazing honestly it's like 
uh, the natural parks that there are, all of the different, um, I'm always on Instagram seeing different places that people find. And I'm like, I can't believe that some of these places are really in the U.S. Like the the area of like New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, those places just astound me because some of the the geography that you can see there is just absolutely breathtaking. And I don't think I've ever seen anything like it in other parts of the, of the world. So hmm. I, I, I do understand that not being able to travel internationally can be hard, but even in the U S there is so, so many beautiful things to see that it's kind of, I haven't even been to all 50 States and mm-hmm. I know that each state has its own gems and its own beauty to be discovered. Um, whether it's like the really traveled locations or whether it's um, more hidden places that maybe more locals know about, but the U S definitely has a lot, a lot to see. That, that's wonderful to share. Do you have any tips for people who are maybe new to traveling? Um, you know, maybe they, they, didn't think traveling was for them for this situation, but now they're realizing they, they could explore places like Utah and Arizona. How, how would you recommend getting started? Yes. Um, I think it really depends on where the person may be coming from. Cause I know, especially yeah. in some cities, especially if the person is coming from a city, people may not drive. I have a lot of friends that are from New York that don't drive. Um, mm-hmm. And if you're going to be going to New Mexico, Arizona, you definitely need to drive or have somebody that can drive. Um, Mm -hmm. I think if you're just starting out, the best thing would be to try and do it with a friend. I know at times it may be hard to kind of coordinate schedules. I know I've definitely had that issue. Um, but even if it's just like a weekend trip or something like that, to try and kind of dip your toes in the water and see how comfortable you feel with being exposed to different places, to different kinds of people. Because as we move throughout the country, we are going to experience different kinds of people that don't think the same way as we do, that aren't from the same yeah. community that we are. And we need, we do need to be prepared for that because they may not react to us the way that we may be as open to them. Like they may not be as mm-hmm. open to us. That's a very important point to prepare people for, I think. And uh, one question I get a lot too is, you know, am I allowed to travel if I am undocumented? Um, And that's something, you know, definitely if you have a, I just want to say if you have an immigration lawyer or access to speaking to any lawyers, you'd want to talk to someone to get individual advice on that. Mm -hmm. In general, there's, you know, there's definitely risks involved, like nothing is risk free. Um, I also know there are many people who, who are undocumented who travel regularly within the U S and go on planes. Um, so it's just, it's kind of like a personal risk decision, I would say, you know, weighing, weighing the risk and your comfort level. Definitely. Yes. I unfortunately can't say too much to it because I have not had to go through it myself. Um, but I definitely, it would be more, you have to, you have to weigh your own pros and cons to see what would work best for you. And speaking with the lawyer is definitely the best way to go. Yeah. And I think another factor too is uh, to think about is if you live in a state where you're um, able to get a license and use that as a form of ID, Mm -hmm. that can also kind of change the factors for people. Right. But not all states provide that. Right. Yeah. Um, So the next thing I wanted to ask you about is just kind of bigger picture pulling together these themes of uh, finances when it comes to traveling and mental health and what traveling has done for you um, just as a person, part of your identity, what, on a broader level, why do you think that if this is important um, for Latinas and women that you're speaking to in your audience? Because I think as a demographic, well, Latinas in general have always, at least within the U.S., always seen as kind of like the bottom tier that we, a lot of us or a lot of our parents, our mothers could be working as um, cleaners or as housemaids. And we never seem to be shown in a way that we enjoy life, that we can Mm. have fun, that we can experience everything that the world has to offer. And honestly, we can and we should be able to. I know that depending on each person's individual circumstance, that could be defined a little bit differently. But Mm -hmm. I think that we owe it to ourselves, to our kids, to our ancestors to be able to enjoy life um, as fully as we can in the way that feels best for us. 
That is so beautiful and so important and radical for you to say and for people to hear, I think. Um, I, I want to expand on it a little bit because mm-hmm. that was just um, very, very important. What do you think that would look, what, what would that look like in this country if there were more more Latinas or immigrants um, or just people who haven't been seen as the ones who deserve to enjoy life like you described? If they were owning their power and traveling and doing what they love, like how would that change things? It would give future generations um, somebody to look up to, to see that these women or these people were able to kind of break this barrier as to us not being able to do more or be more. And now I see that somebody has and that I can too. It kind of reminds me of like with... um, Kamala Harris finally being elected with vice president. Like now there's never been a vice president woman, right? So it's like mm-hmm. now that's something that other women can just genuinely feel like I can do that too. So I kind of take mm-hmm. that with this, um, with this scenario as well, that if these women can get to do this or be entrepreneurs or be travelers or just be known within a certain different spheres than the ones that we've normally been put into, that next generations will also feel that they can do that and possibly more. Ooh, so good. (laughs) So good. So important. Um, I was, you know, I had a feeling you were going to say something like that when I saw your page and we connected (laughs) because (laughs) I'm like, there's something political going on here. You know, <laughs> like, you um, know, I, I, I just want to comment that I think it, you're a great example of how you can be resisting without like explicitly talking about politics or human rights or social justice, but like just owning your power and like claiming it and doing what you love is incredibly powerful. And yeah. thank you for being an example for other people to do that. If I could help one person, then I will just be happy that I helped one person. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. I totally agree. Um, So for all of you listening out there who have some passion, maybe it's not traveling, maybe it's baking or making dresses or whatever it is, like, listen to what Flavia is saying here, because, um, you know, you stepping into your power would also help, you know, lift up other people too, just like she's describing. And um, I I talk to people all the time where they're like, you know, I want to fight for immigrants' rights and want to make a difference, but like, I don't know how, but then they have this incredible passion or skill or talent that they're not seeing Mm. could be useful in that. Um, So I just want to encourage people. Do you have any thoughts on on this to add? Yes. I mean, uh, I've, completely agree that everyone has different passions and what they want to go through and what they want to do. And sometimes, right, like you're saying, like what you may ideally want to do, you may not be able to just walk straight up to it. Sometimes your path is going to take you to the right and kind of like in a swirl and a spiral, and then eventually you'll get to it. And then you'll see how all of those other things that you did kind of made sense as to how you got to where you originally wanted to get to, just that for you, it may not have been a straight way through. And that's okay, because sometimes that's life, right? Life is a journey. We're not just going straight to the finish line. We have so many hurdles that we have to get through before we can get to our final goal. I totally agree. I think, if anything, it's like that most of the time for people. And we're kind of told this lie that, like, there's this straight path you can follow, and all you have to do is go to school and get an education and, like, try to get a good job, and then you're set. And so many people do that hoping it will be that easy path and then they're not happy right right and they've like denied you know what they really want to be doing or haven't taken the time to explore it um so traveling is a great way to explore that that certainly was pivotal in um my experience i I always think of like i always think of myself traveling in my early 20s um Mm -hmm. and when i first went to live abroad and I'm like, I wasn't a human until I did that. I feel like I didn't have an identity before. I completely agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Was that your experience too? I mean, you were always traveling. So. Yeah, but even still then, like, uh, I'll admit, like, I did travel a lot, but I... I was still a teenager, right? I was still a child. I was still a teenager. And I still wasn't absorbing all of this new information. And although it was influencing me in certain ways, it definitely wasn't until I did get to like my early to mid 20s that I really 
was way more immersed into it. Cause at first it was just something I did because like, I liked, I did like it. And because also it was something that my parents talked about a lot and were involved in themselves. So I'm like, well, you know, as a child, you're always looking up to your parents. So I was like, yeah, I need Mm -hmm. to do that too. But then eventually it also just became me as well. And I think Mm -hmm. one of the pivotal moments for me was when I did um, a solo trip. I did a backpacking trip through Colombia and Panama for about two months or just under two months. And I literally went by myself. I knew nobody in either country. I was just winging it all. (laughs) I landed in Medellin with four nights in Medellin Mm -hmm. and then I had no plan after that and I had a great time overall Mm, that's amazing (laughs) that's some of the best traveling I've done where like you purposely don't make a plan yep you just go with the flow oh I had one of the best trips in my life doing that (laughs) yeah it was in um Costa Rica oh that's awesome oh my goodness I went with some friends and we ended up in Panama without planning it (laughs) (laughs) it was really amazing Wonderful. Well, Flavia, thank you so much for all your insights and inspiring people. I'm sure this is going to help a lot of people at least think about um, traveling as a way to explore themselves, even if it's just within the U.S. and if possible, abroad too, to explore their cultures. Um, And, you know, if not traveling for them, like something else that speaks to their passion, helps them explore themselves and and their interests. So thank you. And please share with everyone um, where they can find you and support you. Thank you. First, thank you so much for having me on this podcast. I'm really excited. I've really enjoyed this conversation. And it has me thinking about things that I I may not think on my day to day, right? But that really are the underlying roots of like why I talk about the things that I talk about, because these are the things that really fuel me and give me passion as to like why, why I like to travel, why I like to talk about it and why I kind of want women, especially Latinas, to really get out there and do what they what they love, like what they personally love and have, feel passion for. Um, so people can find me on Instagram. I have two different Instagrams, my main travel page, which is at Latina Traveler, and my new podcast Instagram page, which is at Latina Traveler Podcast. Um, I will also be starting a blog very soon with that same name. Um, I just haven't gotten around to it yet (laughs) too much too many things to do too little time (laughs) but I will get there (laughs) congratulations on on starting all this um and I hope it's the first of many conversations I already have like 10 more questions I want to ask you obviously (laughs) so maybe we could do another sometime you know oh um, for sure but then after you like kind of figure out the next stage of how to travel and cover because one thing I really want to talk to you about sometime is like how do you continue travel as a theme in your life when, as you get older and maybe have a family, because that's something we're, we're struggling with to navigate right now. <laughs> right. No, I totally yeah. get that. That's definitely yeah. one thing that's been on my mind for the future when it gets here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much. You as well. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to the Immigrant Finance Show. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't done so already and leave us a review so we can reach more people to help. Also, did you know we started a free Facebook group for immigrant families who want to build generational wealth? We're doing free monthly trainings covering everything from investing to online business. Plus, you will be in there with a network of other inspiring members of our community. Make sure to join us at facebook.com slash groups slash immigrant finance. And we'll see you there.